ask you to take your Bible and turn with me, if you will, Gospel of John, chapter 16. John, chapter 16. And we'll begin reading in just a moment at the 16th verse. So John 16, 16. And then reading from verse 16 down through the end of the chapter. Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 16 to 33. Lord Jesus is speaking. He's talking to his disciples. He's preparing them for things to come that he knows about that they have no idea about. We'll say more about that in a moment. Right now, let's read John 16 and verse 16. The Lord said, A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith to us, unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, What is this that he saith? A little while. We cannot tell what he saith. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him, and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said? A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow, but her hour is come, because, I'm sorry, because her hour is come, but as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish, for joy that a man is born into the world. And now, and ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came therefore from the Father, and am come into the world. Again I leave the world, and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask of thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Let's look again at that last verse. The Lord said, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Lord, take this word by your Holy Spirit and convey it to our hearts now, we pray. In these next few moments, let us set aside those things which would distract. Let us focus entirely upon you and upon your word. Lord, give us strength, give us wisdom, direct in all that we say and do. And forgive us, Lord, anything that would stand in the way of your moving and blessing and teaching us. Help us, Lord, that we might learn in this hour that which you can use in our minds and hearts and lives to be better servants of yours, to be stronger in our faith, to be greater in our trust, and then to be better messengers to help and encourage others and point them to the Savior. Now prevail, Lord, in all that we're doing here. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In Christian churches, 
there are a lot of terms that we use that maybe a lot of other people don't use, and that's understandable. You go to just about any field or area of life, you're gonna find that people use terms and languages that others don't use. Doctors use words that others don't use. The mechanics use words that others don't use. Attorneys use words that nobody understands. And uh, this, you know, the, the truth of the matter is, every area of life has its own terminology. In Christian churches, there are terms we hear a great deal like rapture, Armageddon, tribulation. Now the word tribulation just means trouble, and that's exactly what it means, trouble. And we talk about the seven year tribulation period, and we've been going through the revelation on Wednesday night, and we're in that part of the revelation where we're talking about that seven year period, which is yet future. I, I've had, I don't know how many times this year I've been asked, are we in the tribulation? I understand why people are asking that, but I can confidently tell you, no, we're not. Now, the good news is we're not in the tribulation. Bad news is that time's gonna be worse <laughs> than what we're going through now. So, uh, but, but this is definitely not it. But wouldn't it be wonderful if all the trouble of all the world's history was combined to one seven year period? Wouldn't that be great? You could plan for it, you could get ready for it. You say, well, you know, life's been great. We've got seven hard years coming up. We'll get through those and then everything's gonna be great again. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It doesn't work that way. It doesn't. You say, man, I, if it's gonna be worse than it is now, I don't wanna be here. I got good news for you. You don't have to be, you don't. But there's trouble in every era of life. In every period of history, there's trouble, and there's trouble in every life. Now, not everybody has the same trouble, and, and to be quite frank with you, we ought to be thankful for that. Now, some people have trouble far worse than others, and some people handle it better than others. But everybody has trouble in their life. Now, I don't say that to be gloomy. I don't say it to discourage you. I say it to be realistic and to offer you some hope. In this chapter, John chapter 16, and it's true also of 13, 14, 15, 17, uh, the Lord is preparing his disciples for trouble that's about to come. They don't know. The disciples don't know what's coming, but he does. They do not know or understand that he is going to be arrested right before their eyes. They do not know and understand that they're going to run away from him and leave him alone with those who have taken him, and those same people who have taken him are going to turn him over to others who intend to kill him. They don't understand that. They don't know this. They do not know that they are going to fear for their own lives. The fact of the matter is, all of the apostles eventually, not immediately, not right after this, but eventually all of them except John were martyred. And all of them were killed with the sword or other means, thrust through with a spear, other things. All of them gave their lives. John alone was spared. And sometimes we read about that and say, well, that was back in the Roman Empire, and it was. And so that was thousands of years ago on another part of the world. Good thing that doesn't go on today. Well, it does. I want to share something with you. I, I say I want to. I don't really want to because I wish it wasn't there to be shared. So let me rephrase it. I, I think I need to share with you that there are people today who are being killed simply because they call themselves Christians. Now, are they all born-again believers? I do not know. They may be, they may not be, but they call themselves Christians. Doubtless they attend some sort of a church. And they're being killed simply because they travel under the name Christian. Boy, have you got evidence on that? Yeah, I have an article here from the magazine Christianity Today. Uh, so well, how recent is that article? Yesterday. That's pretty recent, isn't it? Okay, here it is. The article is titled, and I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but the article is titled, The Top 50 Countries Where It's Hardest to Be a Christian. It says every day, listen to these 
numbers. Every day, eight Christians worldwide are killed because of their faith. Eight every day, but that's not all. Every week, 182 churches or Christian buildings are attacked. Every month, 309 Christians are imprisoned unjustly. For what reason? For being a Christian. Now here's, they talk about 50. Here are what they say are the top 10 countries where it's hardest to be a Christian. Uh, we'll start with number one and go to 10. So one being the highest, not the lowest. Number one, North Korea. Number two, Afghanistan. Number three, Somalia. Number four, Libya. Number five, Pakistan. Number six, Eritrea. Eritrea, excuse me. Number seven, Sudan. Eight, Yemen. Nine, Iran. And ten, India. So, well, I, I thought it was worse than some other countries. Well, this is just the top ten, folks. They have 40 more on their list. There are, round numbers, 200 countries in the world. A little bit less than that. I, the number changes from time to time, but uh, round numbers, 200 countries in the world. If there are 50 of them where Christians are persecuted, that's one-fourth of the countries of the world. That's significant. If it were one country, it would be significant. The article goes on and notes that Asia, uh, in an article titled Asia Rising, one of their own articles they're referencing, it says, as India entered the top 10 for the first time, while China rose from number 43 to number 27. Two in five Asian Christians now face high levels of persecution. Now I'm gonna stop there. There's a lot more to the article, but I think you've got the idea. This is not something that just happened thousands of years ago on the other part of the world. This is something that is happening right now, today. There's so many things that we talk about and we argue about and we debate about that, that ended centuries ago. And we're still arguing about those things. We're not doing anything about the problems that are happening right now. And the truth of the matter is we must. We must. Jesus is saying in this world you're going to have tribulation. So you and I haven't suffered as folks that we've just read about have suffered. And we ought to thank God for that. And we ought to thank God for the freedom we have. Now, you may be sitting here thinking, you may be listening saying, well, I don't think we have as much religious freedom as we used to have. And I, I'd have to agree with you there. Back in 2001, a, a group of us, some of them present here today, went to Japan. And it seemed there that in Japan, there was more religious freedom than in our own country. Isn't that something? Why would that be? I'll tell you why it would be. Because Douglas MacArthur set up the, the Constitution for Japan. That's why. And yet, we need to be grateful for the freedom we do have. We still have it pretty good, folks. We do. And, and we ought to be thankful and thank God for that. But trouble comes to all of us. It may not be in the form of horrific persecution as, as we've just read about. It may come in the form of family or friends who simply do not like the fact that you've become a Christian. We had a man stand in this pulpit years ago. We had a, a Sunday evening here years ago where we had folks give unusual testimonies. I called it unusual testimony tonight. Night. We had three people come and give their testimony of outstanding things and situations. One had been a, a prisoner of war in, in World War II and testified about that. Another man said that when he became a Christian, his family disowned him. This is here in America. And he continued to live at his house, but he lived in the basement, and the rest of the family lived in the rest of the house because he was not allowed to live there with the rest of them. Now, that's not like the persecution that we've read about in these top 50 countries, but it's closer to home, at least for that man, And then there are other problems that come into our lives. Illness. We live in a sin-cursed world. And in a sin-cursed world, bad things are going to happen. And, and the truth of the matter is, bad things do happen to good people. 
That's a fact. And sometimes they happen simply because we do not live in a perfect world. Well, we were talking to somebody just recently, just this week, about uh, chastening. And a lot of Christians get the idea that if everything's not going great in your life, if you're having problems, God's angry with you and he's punishing you. That's not necessarily true. That should not be the first conclusion that you jump to. It's easy, and I've said this here countless times, it's easy to know if you are being chastened to the Lord. It is? It is. If you're having trouble, you're having problem, and it's because God is chastening you, here's some factors that are going to be present. Number one, it's, it's not going to be without cause. So the problem that you have is coming to you to get your attention to cause you to turn back to the Lord. Well, I don't believe that. Well, read Hebrews chapter 12 and you may change your belief. But the truth of the matter is God does bring things into our lives to get our attention to cause us to turn back to him because we've gone astray. But how do you know if that's what's happening in your life when you have trouble? Here's how you know. Is there any connection between the trouble that you're having and a sin in your life? If there is, most likely that's the Lord telling you, you need to stop this, you need to repent, you need to get back. But what if there isn't any? And I'm going to tell you, most often that's going to be the case. There isn't going to be any because most often your troubles are not God chastening you. God only chastens you when you need it. And the truth is, if you're doing right and you're living with the Lord, let me ask you this question. Everybody here is familiar with the story of Job and all the problems that Job had. And you, and you know about it. What was Job doing wrong when his problem started? And the answer is nothing. He wasn't doing anything wrong. Oh, but he had trouble. He did. Not because he was doing something wrong. What was happening to him? He was under satanic attack. You don't have to take my, my word for that. Read the story yourself. He was under satanic attack, not because he did something wrong, actually because he was doing things right. Now, that's another thing people say. Well, how do I know if the devil's attacking me? Well, let me tell you something. If you're not right with the Lord, if you're not living for the Lord, the Lord might be chastening you to bring you back. The devil's not going to attack you. Why? Why waste his time on you? You're already doing what he wants you to do. He, he's going to deal with somebody who's trying to be effective, trying to live for the Lord, trying to point people to him. That's what he, why he attacked Job. Paul talks about being given a thorn in the flesh, and what did he call it? A messenger of Satan. Who was Paul? One of the most effective Christians that ever lived. Used of God like few people in the history of the planet have ever been used, and still being used of God today, millennia after his death. Satan will attack those who are active for the Lord. But then, as we've already said, there are trouble, there is trouble that comes into your life just because we live in an imperfect world. And there are different reasons why we get sick. Sometimes we get sick just because there's sickness in the world. And you come across it. Sometimes Sickness can be a chastening, but we've already dealt with that. Can sickness ever be an attack of Satan? Yes, we already talked about that in Paul's case. And then sometimes you're sick for the glory of God. Jesus comes across a man who's born blind. His disciples said, Lord, who, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Somebody did something wrong that this fellow was born blind. Jesus said, that's not it. That's not it. He said, this man is blind for the glory of God. How's that the glory of God? Well, in that case, Jesus healed him and gave him his eyesight. And the text tells us he was over 30 years of age. And now he can see. Preacher, you ever known anybody who's blind got their sight back? As a matter of fact, I have. Not many, but I have. And we talked about that not long ago here. The truth is, Sometimes God is going to work through your illness and bring you out of it or work through your illness and be a blessing to others. 
We sang hymns this morning, and I think two of our hymns were written by Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby was blind. She wasn't born blind, but she was blinded as a little child. And she never got her eyesight back in this world, but wrote some of the greatest hymns ever written. And we haven't done this in years, but we have done it before. We set aside a Sunday and just sang all Fanny Crosby songs. You could do that and, and easily in one Sunday. There were so many of them, you could do it Sunday after Sunday. There are other people that God has worked through their illness, their infirmity, to bring about his glory. So trouble comes to us for many reasons. And Jesus is preparing the disciples for trouble that's ahead. Maybe he knows about some trouble that has come or is coming into your life. So maybe what we're about to look at will be a help to you. Take a look, John 16 and verse 16. Jesus said, A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Jesus is telling disciples clearly that trouble is coming. He's told them this before. They didn't get it. They didn't understand it. They don't follow exactly what he's trying to get across to them. How do you know they didn't? Well, I read the next verse, verse 17. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he saith a little while? We cannot tell what he saith. They don't understand. They're not getting it. Now, this is John chapter 16. This is within probably an hour of John chapter 14. It's all the same night. Where Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Now look. Here he says, again, same night. This is not another day. This is not a week or so later. This is the same night. He says, a little while you shall not see me. And again, a little while you shall see me because I go to the Father. What did he say? I go prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. He'd already told them that. They don't understand it. But Thomas didn't understand it back in chapter 14. Jesus said, whether I go, you know, and the way you know, Thomas said, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. How can we know the way? Don't, don't know, don't get it, don't understand. And the others now do not understand, though he's telling them essentially the same thing. Look at verse 19. Jesus, now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me? They're not getting it, but he's going to, un he's going to explain it to them. He's going to help them with their misunderstanding. Look at what he says in verse 30. I'm sorry, verse 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. Ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. You know what the Lord's saying there? You're going to have trouble. It's coming. You're going to have it, but understand this. When you are weeping, the world's going to rejoice. What is bad for you, they're going to think is good. What hurts you, they're going to think is wonderful, and they will celebrate. How do you know this is true? Well, number one, the Lord said so. Number two, is that not what happened when Jesus was crucified? There were people, and, and sometimes we get the impression it was the whole city of Jerusalem. It was not. That's very clear if you follow the text closely. But there were people who cried out, crucify him, crucify him. There were people at the cross who said, he saved others himself, he cannot save. Let him come down from the cross if he's the Savior. There were people who rejoice. They rejoice in your trouble. And the Lord is saying, you're going to weep. And the world is going to celebrate while you're weeping. 
Now, it might be this verse. It may not be this verse, but it's at the very least the truth of this verse. It was the inspiration for a poem titled Solitude, written by a lady named Ella Wheeler Cox. Uh, I'm sorry, Ella Wheeler Wilcox, more than a century ago. Let me read it to you. It's not very long. The first part of this, the first line, is going to be real familiar to you, I'm sure. Again, the title is Solitude by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. She wrote, Laugh, and the world laughs with you. Weep, and you weep alone. For the sad old earth must borrow its mirth, but has trouble enough of its own. Sing, and the hills will answer. Sing, it is lost on the air. The echoes bound to a joyful sound, but shrink from voicing care. Rejoice, and men will seek you. Grieve, and they will turn and go. They want full measure of all your pleasure, but they do not want, uh, they do not need your woe. Be glad, and your friends are many. Be sad, and you lose them all. There are none to decline your nectared wine, but alone you must drink life's gall. Feast and your halls are crowded. Fast and the world goes by. Succeed and give and it helps you live, but no man can help you die. There is a room in the halls of pleasure. There is room in the halls of pleasure for a large and lordly train. But one by one, we must all file on through the narrow aisles of pain. Does that not sound like what Jesus is saying here? Look at verse 20 again. Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. Ye shall be sorrowful, but that's not the end. Look at the very end of verse 20. He says, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have problems. You're going to have sorrow. You're going to have weeping. And others are not going to join you. But your sorrow is going to be turned into joy. And then look at verse 22. Where he says, And now therefore, ye, ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. Your heart shall rejoice. And watch the last phrase of 22. And your joy no man taketh from you. What is he saying? He's saying there's hope. There's hope. You're going through trouble. You're having trouble now or you're going to have trouble. But there is hope. Do not think that it will never end. Do not think that your situation is permanent. It is not. Everything in this life is temporary. All of it. And we need to know and understand that. I want to share this with you. The Lord has offered us hope in the promise of answered prayer. When I was a young Christian, my pastor wisely gave me a little packet. It was about that big, published by a group called Navigators, and they did a wonderful work. And in that packet were five little cards, and they were verses to memorize. And I took them, and I kept them in my shirt pocket, and whenever I had time, I'd take them out and I'd read over them. And, I, and that's why I began to memorize scripture. Say, have you memorized the whole Bible? Not nearly. Not nearly. Uh, well, you quote scripture all the time. Yes, but not all of it. <laughs> okay. There, there's certain parts that we get real well. But I began memorizing. And I encourage you to memorize scripture. It will help you. The psalmist says in Psalm 119, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. It helps keep you from sin. But it also helps you when you need to witness. You ever been in a situation where you want to talk to somebody about the Lord, you don't have your Bible with you? Well, if you've got the word memorized, then, then you can share it. You can quote it. And then the Holy Spirit will use the word that you memorize and use it to encourage your heart and to instruct you and to bring you along even in times of trouble. He will remind you of that which you need. I encourage you to memorize scripture. Well, how do you do it? Take one verse at a time. Take a verse that speaks to you. The Lord has used that verse to speak to you. Write it down. Maybe write it several times. Carry it in your pocket, if you will, like dude. Now, one, one brother I knew did this. He, uh, he kind of had a lead foot when he was driving. So he 
made little verse cards and he put them on the speed on of his car past a certain speed so he couldn't go past that speed. I don't recommend that one because you take your eyes off the road too much, but I guess it worked for him. He's still around. Here's, here's what I'm trying to show you. Here's one of the first verses I memorized, not verse 23, but 24, but let's read verse 23. Jesus said, and in that day, you shall ask me nothing. What day? The day when your joy is full. That, in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Now he's about to tell them, you haven't asked anything in my name before. Why hadn't they? Think about it. When they prayed in Israel, these are Jewish men, they didn't pray in Jesus' name. This is where he tells them to pray in his name. This is where that begins. Now, he's mentioned it before, but this is where he instructs them to pray in his name. Look at verse 24, and this is the verse that I memorized early on. Hitherto. How many of you use that word in a sentence this week? No, I didn't think so. But you know what it means? It means up till now. That's what it means. Until now. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. And they hadn't. They hadn't been praying. They didn't close their prayers in Jesus' name. Now he says, I want you to do that. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. And the promise of answered prayer is going to encourage you. It's going to help you pray through things. Oh, but pastor, I've been praying about this thing, and it hasn't changed. I take you back to Paul again, who said there was given him a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. You know what he said? He said, I asked the Lord three times to remove that. And the third time the Lord did? No. He said, the Lord came back and said, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. You know what the Lord was telling Paul? I'm not going to take that away from you. I'm going to use it in your life, and I'm going to work through it, and you're going to glorify me with that. Again, sometimes sickness, affliction, trouble is for the glory of God was in Paul's case. But ask, Jesus says. Ask and you shall receive. Why? That your joy may be full. You know what that tells us, among other things? It tells us the Lord wants to answer your prayers. Well, why doesn't he answer? I just told you one reason why not. Well, are there other reasons? Yes, the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If, if, if I'm out here robbing the bank and I'm praying, oh, Lord, please don't let me get caught, and is, is the Lord likely to answer that prayer? No. And then James says you ask and you have not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. You pray for the wrong thing. That's what he means when he says you ask amiss. Don't pray for something you know is not right. Don't, don't pray for something bad to happen. Don't pray for yourself to get something that's purely for your own selfishness. But you pray. You pray in God's will and your prayers are going to be answered. Your joy may be full. So verse 25, the Lord then says, These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you, I will pray the Father for you. Why not? At that time, when I'm no more speaking in Proverbs, you're going to ask in my name, and I'm not going to pray the Father for you. Why not? Why wouldn't the Lord Jesus do that? He'll tell you why. Verse 27, For the Father himself loveth you. What he's saying is you can go directly to the Father's throne with your prayers. That's what he's saying. Well, I thought the Lord Jesus is our high priest. You thought correctly. But what he's saying is the Father loves you personally. God the Father loves you. And when you pray, you can talk. to. Him. That's why you pray and say, Our Father, which art in heaven. Now do that. Understand that as Hebrews says, you can come boldly before the throne of his grace. You're a God's child. And when you come before him, he listens to you. 
Revelation 5 tells us your prayers are saved in heaven before the throne of God in golden vials like sweet-smelling savers. Your prayers are precious to him. I think maybe our problem sometimes is we don't pray enough. Verse 27 again, For the Father himself loveth you because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. Is that a special blessing for those who believe in Jesus and love him? Yes, that's exactly what that is. And here he emphasizes his deity. Verse 28, I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Now they thought they were catching on. They thought they were getting it. They felt that their faith was firm and they were understanding all that he was teaching them. Look at their words in verse 29. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Now that's good. That's wonderful words they're saying, and there's truth there. And I'm going to t stand here and tell you I believe that when these men said this, they meant it. And they meant it with all their heart. But notice what Jesus says next. Jesus answered them, verse 31, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. You tell me that you believe. Do you know at the Last Supper, the last Passover, this is that same night. That's when these words are being spoken, that same night. Peter says, Lord, I'd die before I'd turn on you. And then says, so said they all. Every one of them said the same thing. We'd die. We'd never turn on you. And Jesus says to Peter, what? Before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. And he did. You know something that I, I just really noticed maybe six months or so ago? From the time that Jesus is arrested, you see Peter following Jesus far off. And you see Peter there watching the trial. But when you come over to the cross, and it talks about others who are at the cross, Peter's not mentioned. Now he's back there later. He's there on Sunday with the others. He is one of the first to see the resurrected Lord. But I had never noticed before that Peter's not mentioned at the cross. Was he there? I don't know. I don't know. John was there, says so. Mary was there, says others were there. Peter isn't mentioned. Was he there? I don't know. If he wasn't there, where was he? Well, he may have been off weeping somewhere. I, I, I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. Peter's not mentioned there. But Peter did what? He came back. He came back. And not only is he one of the first eyewitnesses of the resurrection, but he lives the rest of his life just like he promised he would. But here in this verse, the Lord tells them, The hour cometh, and yea, is now come, this night, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And they did. They left him alone. But notice the rest of the verse. And yet, I am not alone, because the Father is with me. You know what the Lord is teaching us here? If everybody else leaves you, if everybody else lets you down, if everybody else forsakes you and flees as the disciples did with Jesus, you're not alone. You're still not alone. Just as the Lord said, I'm not alone because the Father is with me. He says this, the, back verse 27, the Father himself loveth you. Did he not say, I will never leave you nor forsake you? When you feel like you're all alone, you're not alone. 
the Father is with you. Then finally, verse 33. The Lord says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Three precious promises in verse 33. We'll look at them one at a time. We'll be finished today. Promise number one. These things have I spoken to you that in me you might have peace. Isaiah in chapter 9 writes this. He says, for unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. What does he say here? He says, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. I want to give you peace. And you come to him and you rest in him and you pray to him and you trust in him and you will have peace. Do you know that's what David was talking about in Psalm 23 when he says, Thou preparest me a table in the presence of mine enemies? That's what he's talking about. That peace. Later on we read it's called peace that passes all understanding. You can have peace. You have peace through faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. These things have I spoken to you that in me you might have peace. Second promise. We don't like this one as much. We've been talking about it this whole morning. In the world you shall have tribulation. Do you see that that also is a promise? You're going to have trouble in this world. You just are. That's the second promise. It is guaranteed that you will have trouble. But here's the third promise. He says, but be of good cheer. What does that mean, be of good cheer? Does that mean get excited and smile and laugh and clap your hands and, and shout? Yeah. It really means that? Well, think about it. Did not the Lord in the Sermon on the Mount say when people treat you badly, when they say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad. Well, what does rejoice and be exceeding glad look like? Is this it? No, that's not it, is it? What does rejoice and exceeding glad look like? It looks like you're shouting and clapping your hands and, and praising God. That's what it looks like. And I'm going to tell you the honest truth, folks. This is what the Lord is saying here. Be of good cheer. Why? Last phrase. I have overcome the world. This world is temporary. We quoted this song just a week or two ago. Uh, it says, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. And that's a fact. That's a fact. I want to show you one more verse, and then we'll pray. Leave John 16, if you will, and turn with me over to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation 2 and 3, you know, are the letters, the seven letters that the Lord dictated to John to the seven churches of Asia. In chapter 2, we're going to focus on one verse, but I want to read to you just quickly the whole letter to the church at Smyrna. There's a note, it's not part of the inspired word of God, there's a note in my Bible between verses 7 and 8 that says the message to Smyrna, period of the great persecutions. But what is the word of God it begins at verse 8. And the Lord Jesus says, tells John to write, and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Now verse 10 is what I want you to focus on. The Lord said to the church at Smyrna, and I think he'll say this to you, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. Who's doing that? The devil. 
The devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation, you shall have trouble ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That's what the Lord means when he says, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. This isn't it. This isn't the end. What's happening now, what's going to happen, that's not it. That's just a temporary chapter. Be faithful unto death. I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. In the world you shall have tribulation. Be a good cheer. The Lord Jesus Christ has overcome the world. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for this time together. Lord, you know what's in the hearts and minds of people here and those listening. Lord, you know what's happening now. You know what will happen that we have no idea about. Just as the disciples that night had no idea what was about to transpire. But Lord, what we do know is that you have overcome the world. And we can trust in you and we can follow you. And you will lead us out on the other side to go home. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If there's anyone listening this morning who doesn't have the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he promised, he says, uh, my peace give I unto you. If you don't have that peace, the great news is you can. As we said, the Father, as Jesus said, the Father loves you. He loves you more than you can ever imagine. God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to pay for your sins on the cross. So that if you would believe in him, you would not perish, not die, but have everlasting life. And what he's asking you to do is believe him, trust him. Right now, right where you are, bow your head. Pray from your heart and call on him. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You ask him to save you. Say, Lord, I believe. I believe that you love me. I believe that you gave your life on the cross to pay for my sins. But I believe that you're alive today and I'm trusting you as my living Savior to forgive me, to save me, and to give me everlasting life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now maybe you prayed that prayer, maybe you didn't. But you call on the Lord, ask Him to save you. He says He'll do it. And He always keeps His word. But I would suppose that most of the people listening now, here in person or otherwise, I suppose you've maybe already trusted the Lord as your Savior, and if you have, that's wonderful. These promises that we've read, the promise, the prayer promise, the promise of peace, and the promise of trouble and the promise that he has overcome the world these are all yours because you're a child of God because the Father loves you as you have loved the Lord Jesus rest in him trust in him you need prayer talk to us help us we'll be glad to spend the time with you heads are bowed eyes are closed we're going to conclude the prayer and then we're going to sing a hymn together as we do if God spoke into your heart this is your time to respond if you need to come forward and pray come and pray if you're going to make a decision in your seat you certainly can do that wherever you are let the Lord have his will and his way in your life Father bless now as we sing this hymn think about the words that you've given us and trust in you in Jesus name Amen